we're going to discuss multiple regression. Recall that regression is a correlational design, whereas ANOVA is an experimental design. Uh, in regression, we're attempting to explain uh, the amount of variance accounted for in a model. Uh, what we're trying to do is essentially a prediction, uh, show how some variables might be predictive of another variable. Um, we're going to call that dependent variable the criterion variable, and what was once called our independent variables are now going to be referred to as our predictor variables. What's different here is that everything is continuous. So just like in ANOVA, we have a continuous dependent variable. Um, but in ANOVA, we're trying to either manipulate or describe differences among groups. Uh, however, in regression, everything is continuous. So we're trying to look at continuous predictor variables and see how they relate to the uh, continuous criterion variable. So if we have a significant F-test, then we're saying that there is a statistically significant relationship between our predictor variable or variables and our criterion variable. So recall that in simple regression, it's just like computing the slope. Um, you have an intercept and we have a, a slope that we're now going to call a regression coefficient. So we can basically use the intercept and the regression coefficient and our raw x values to make a prediction about what we expect a criterion variable y to be. So we don't know what y is going to be. We don't know what, what the criterion variable is going to be, but we can try and predict that if we know the relationship between the two variables exists. So um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize errors between what y is and what we predict it will be. The closer our prediction, the less error there is in the model. So this is an example of how the formula mathematically works out. Um, Recall that we can always look at the relationship between variables by establishing the Pearson R. Another thing to keep in mind is that if I don't know anything about an outcome variable, one thing that I can use is the mean. The mean I would use if I knew nothing else about uh, an outcome variable. That would be my best prediction. And then we can uh, uh, compute the slope. Uh, which is simply by looking at the uh, sum of the covariances um, uh, between my two variables and dividing it by uh, the sum of the squared error variances of uh, the other variable, of, 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 of say, my, my x variable. Uh, in this case, that would be my prediction variable. So x is prediction, y is criterion. And just to take a look here, I have two sets of scores. You know, so an individual uh, took maybe two measures, a self-esteem measure and uh, another type of measure, maybe a measure for depression, for example. And so we can look at uh, the means and we can determine how the means, uh, not, not everybody scored the mean and we'll have a set of deviation scores for each variable, which we can square and then uh, multiply the uh, deviation scores together and we can get the uh, uh, covariance values. Now our prediction column is simply um, the difference between uh, the, uh, uh, what we predicted from our regression equation, the intercept plus the reg regression equation, uh, plus the slope times the uh, x value, and what the person actually scored. So notice we have 87.95 here as a uh, predicted score. All right, and the residual, the difference is what they actually scored. The person actually scored an 85. And so we have a, a difference of uh, uh, almost three points, 2.95 uh, points. Uh, we can square that value, and that'll be a useful term mathematically. And then our, our, our regression term, remember I said the, the, that that's simply the difference between um, what we predict and... Uh, uh, and, and what the mean value was, and that's how we get uh, the regression value, and we can square that as well and sum them up, and those have mathematical properties that we'll use, and i show you on the next page. We can take, we can compute the sum of squares regression and divide by degrees of freedom, 
and uh, we'll get a mean square regression. And we can do the same thing with the sum of squares residuals and divide by the degrees of freedom, and we'll get the mean square residuals. And so you see the same special case for ANOVA, the same formula for ANOVA is very similar to what we do in regression, and that's because ANOVA is simply a special case of regression. Uh, the, the, the math is very, very similar. When I run a, a multiple regression in SPSS, I can look at the significance of an F test and see if my model is significant. And then I can also see if uh, uh, I can also look at my, my beta weights and see if uh, uh, the, the, the degree of change um, in my, uh, uh, between my uh, uh, predictive variable and criterion variable. So obviously, if my model is not significant, then I'm saying that there's no significant relationship between the two variables. So it's not ever enough to just determine statistical significance. We also have to determine practical significance of a model using uh, R-squared. Um, remember Cohen's F? Well, there's a Cohen's F-squared, but uh, it's more common to use R squared in our analyses, and so uh, there's a mathematical relationship between F squared and R squared. And Cohen indicated that uh, the values for R squared that we should be looking at are uh, 0 0.02, 0 0.13, and 0.26. Now R squared and eta squared are essentially the same thing mathematically, but we have different uh, uh, structures for identifying small, medium, and large uh, effect sizes. And the reason for that is because it's much more common to have a larger number of predictor variables. Hence, you have a better opportunity of, of, of getting a stronger model. We can also look at the statistical significance of each predictor variable by looking at t, uh, t tests of the beta weights. And we can also look at the practical significance of each predictor variable. So notice here, um, I'm showing you how we would identify statistical significance uh, in a multiple regression with uh, two predictor variables. In this case, my dependent variable is the average percentage correct on a statistics exam, and I'm using as my predictors an English aptitude test score and a math aptitude test score. And note that uh, f of 297 equals 16.63, p is less than 0 0.001. And what we're saying here is that we've accounted for about 26% of the variance, or 25.5% of the variance in the model, which would be uh, uh, you know, a pretty uh, uh, significant effect size, pretty meaningful effect size. Yeah. So if a regression coefficient for a given x variable represents the average amount of change in uh, the criterion variable, for every unit of change in the predictor, then we want to identify which predictor variables are important in our model. In other words, we know we have a significant model, but are each of our predictor variables important? Well, we can actually run a t-test to find out, and uh, we will test the regression coefficient. So, we will look at the statistical significance of the non-standardized regression coefficient, and that will be um, one piece of evidence. Um, we can also use standardized regression coefficients to identify uh, how the change occurs in standard deviation units. So notice here that math aptitude is a statistically significant predictor. We tested the regression coefficient uh, point uh, uh, the unstandardized regression coefficient, which is 0.119. So that for every unit of change uh, in the uh, uh, stats test percentage, there is a 0.119 increase in, uh, uh, in, in, in mathematics. Or to be specific, it translates to about uh, a ha almost uh, a half a standard deviation increase in math aptitude for every in unit of increase uh, on the stats exam. Now notice that the English aptitude test score was not significant. It was not significant. Um, so, uh, and you can see that it's only increasing about uh, a tenth of a standard deviation unit for every change uh, in, in, in stats percentage 
So once we've determined whether or not uh, each predictor variable is statistically significant, we can also look at the effect size of each predictor variable. And we can do that by examining squared semi-partial correlation coefficients or structure coefficients. So notice that here we have um, three types of uh, th three variables, two predictor variables, uh, x1 and x2, and a criterion variable. Um, the portion that you see in x1 is what, uh, I'm sorry, in 1, in, in section 1, is what x2 uh, predicts of y that isn't predicted by x1. It's just what's unique between x2 and y. And uh, section 2 is the proportion that's redundant. Both x1 and x2 provide that information. Section 3 is what's shared by x1 and x2, your predictor variables, um, that doesn't correlate to y. And then uh, this fourth section is what x1 brings in that's unique to y, but isn't shared with x2. So a zero-order correlation essentially looks at the relationship between uh, two variables. In this case, uh, if we wanted to look at the relationship between y and x2, we would use sections 1 and 2. And sections 3 and 4 um, might remain part of the overall variance of y, but aren't included by uh, 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 in, in, you know, um, aren't uh, in, included in terms of, uh, uh, you know, section 3 uh, doesn't include y and section 4 doesn't include x2. Partial correlations um, show that uh, the relationship between two variables after removing overlap from both variables. And this, in this diagram, uh, we can show the relation between y and x2 after removing the influence of x1 on both variables. In other words, in order to show the influence of uh, x2 um, and, re and remove all the influence of x1, um, we would have to show, uh, we'd have to use section 1 and look at, the real, uh, look at variances in sections 2 and 3. Um, and four, which are all going to be removed. We're going to have to remove part of y and x1 as well. And so the problem with a partial correlation is that although we're looking at what, uh, how x2 and y uh, correlate uniquely, we also lose part of y. Notice sections 2 and 4 are part of y, and we take that out. Notice section 3 is part of x2, and that gets removed. And so we, 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 we lose some information here. So we can use semi-partial correlations, which allow us to keep in all of y and all of x2 and just remove the, x, the, the influence of x1. So, and we can do that mathematically. So we only look at what x2 brings into y that's unique, but we don't lose any information of y. So sections 2 and 4 are kept in y, but only section 1 is kept with uh, x2. And all of x1 is removed. So note that because the variance is removed from y in the partial correlation, it's always going to be larger. But uh, it's always going to be larger than a, than a, than, than a uh, semi-partial correlation. So in this case, notice that the partial correlation is indeed larger than the semi-partial correlation, also known as a part correlation. And but but it's the part correlation that we're interested in. That uh, squared semi-partial correlation coefficient. We can take each of these values and square them, and that tells us the unique amount of variance each predictor variable brings into the model. Notice that math aptitude brings in 21% of the variance of the model, and uh, English aptitude brings in just 2% of the variance uh, that's unique to the model. So clearly. English aptitude wasn't very important in predicting stats exam scores.
but math aptitude was. So Thompson wanted to use structure coefficients as opposed to uh, squared semi partial correlation coefficients. He felt that that was too conservative. And so um, he suggested that we can look at the proportion of the correlation of a predictor variable and the criterion variable. So we can basically take the zero order correlation of each predictor variable and divide it by the multiple correlation coefficient. And then we could square that value and get the unique amount of variance of what is predicted. Now, this is very uh, th th this is very important here. We're only going to be looking at the predicted model. So how much of the variance is brought into the predicted model? So let's say I account for 20, uh, uh, 26 of the variance in the model, and I'm saying 92 percent of that variance of that 26 percent is brought in by math aptitude uniquely. So we're only talking about what is predicted not the entire model. In this regard, um, structure coefficients can be rather uh, overly optimistic, and uh, that's why I don't like them. When predictive variables are not correlated to each other, um, the R squared uh, is the sum of the squared correlations of each predictive variable. But in most research we deal with, we have correlated predictors. And so this produces some redundancy. And if our predictive variables are too heavily correlated, we have what's known as multicollinearity. We generally want to be aware of a multicollinearity problem when our predictive variables correlate at 0 0.80 or higher. Um, when we have a multicollinearity issue, we might want to drop one of the predictive variables or we might want to combine them so that we're not looking at two separate predictors. So we just add them together, for instance. As in all statistics that we run, we have model assumptions. Um, we should make sure that our predictor and criterion variables are continuous. We should make sure that our sample is random, that our criterion variable is normally distributed, that our observations are independent, um, that there's a rel linear relationship between our predictive variables, that our errors are normally distributed, and that we have uh, a constant variance, and that's called homoscedacity. I'll show you that. So this is how we could test to see if our criterion variable was normally distributed, and indeed it was. This is just running a, a box plot. We can look at the linear relationship of our predictor variable to our criterion variable, and it should be uh, somewhat elliptical, not a perfect circle, but kind of an elliptical pattern. Uh, the more round or more circular it becomes, the less of a relationship actually exists. We also want to make sure our data are not conical, as that would uh, indicate heteroscedacity. We would be breaking one of the assumptions. We also want to make sure that our errors in our prediction should be normally distributed, and we can do all of this in SPSS.